Right, friends, well, do turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 8. Now, it's the section from verse 31 to verse 38 I want us to look at tonight. Uh, Christianity, Christianity is a cross-shaped religion. What I mean by that is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ himself was conformed to the cross. But in this passage, we hear that the lives of his followers are to be shaped by the cross as well. And what we read is that that isn't one option amongst many, or it's not an ideal, which seems good in principle, but never works in practice. What we find is that Christ could not have been our saviour if he had not submitted himself to the cross, and that we can't be Christ's disciples unless we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. Okay? So that's what I want us to look at tonight. The reality and importance of the cross. In first century Palestine, the cross was a symbol of crucifixion. And crucifixion was a barbaric method of capital punishment. As far as we know, it was invented by the Persians, and then it was industrialized by the Romans. Uh, now, in the 21st century here in the West, um, well, for a good 100 years or so, the intention has been to make capital punishment where it still exists as painless and as clinical as possible. You know, hanging, electric chair, lethal injection, that sort of thing. Um, the aim of capital punishment in the West is death. That's the purpose. But it wasn't so with crucifixion. With crucifixion, death was merely the end of the process. Crucifixion itself was designed to produce the maximum amount of suffering and the maximum amount of shame before death itself took place, sometimes days later. Crucifixion was so barbaric that no Roman citizen could be crucified without a direct order from Caesar himself. And some of the old Roman writers tell us that it was regarded in polite Roman company to be distasteful even to mention the subject. But today, those connotations are largely lost, aren't they? The cross itself is popular and sanitized and everywhere. You see crosses on churches, you see crosses in church architecture, you sometimes see them on the walls, you see crosses in artwork, you even see crosses on chains around people's necks, and they can be quite beautiful. But the connotations of the real cross are airbrushed away. It's been domesticated and civilized. But the point is, I fear that there's a parallel to that, not just with the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, but with the role of the cross in the lives of Christians also. You see, it's still there, but the danger is that we kind of explain it away. As regards the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, it's toned down and explained away to mean something which isn't quite as stark and quite as significant. And as regards the role of the cross in the life of the Christian, it's watered down so that it becomes more palatable and more easy. But the danger is, when the significance of the cross and what the cross really means is explained away and watered down, then true Christianity itself is in danger of being lost. Now that sounds quite serious, doesn't it? But it is quite serious. And so what I want us to do is to look at this passage and split it into two. Verses 31 to 33, the cross and Christ himself. And then verses 34 to 38, the cross and the Christian. So we'll start with the cross and Christ himself. What happens is the Lord Jesus begins to teach his disciples clearly and plainly about the cross. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed, murdered, and three days rise again. Those factors, suffering, rejection, murder, and resurrection, are the very center of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and for that reason, the very center of the Christian faith. 
But what's it all about? Why does it matter? This is the reason. The cross means a curse. Now, to the Romans, the cross means suffering and shame. The just punishment of one they regarded as a vile offender who didn't deserve to live. But to the Jews, it meant more than that. Deuteronomy 21 tells us this, verses 22 and 23. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he's put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Okay? It's a symbol of the curse of God. And the Apostle Paul quotes that in Galatians chapter 3. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The cross means the curse. So Christ's suffering and death, they mean not just that men regarded him as unfit to live. No, no. They mean that God himself treated him as deserving the full force of the curse of the broken law. Now the law, the law is God's law. And God's law, because it is God's law, rightly demands obedience. You see, um, to be obedient means life. But to be disobedient means that the threat of the law, the curse of the law, is active against us. And that means death. So the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 puts it like this. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. If you work for sin, how does it pay you? Death. If you break the law, how does it treat you? curse it's the same idea you see because sin is the transgression of the law but that death as we know isn't just the biological act of dying it's not just the heart stopping and the brain ceasing to function it's also not just the separation of body and soul uh, ecclesiastes 12 tells us that at death the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. That happens in death. It's more than just biology because we are more than just biological creatures. But real death, the curse of the law, is more than that. And it's pictured in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sin, what happens is they are thrown out of the garden in their shame. You remember that? They try to cover themselves. They're thrown out of the garden in their shame. They are separated from God and from good. And they live in a world of hardship under the curse of God. That's the reality of death. Separation from God in our shame. Cast out from his presence and from all good to live under the curse. And that's the thing that's fulfilled in the second death. Revelation 20. The sea gave up its dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now what that means is that to understand the cross, we need to see that it means the curse of God against sin. And what that means is the just punishment of sin in an eternal hell. That's what curse means. And so when we apply that to the cross of Jesus Christ, what that means is that what happened on the cross of Jesus Christ is the just punishment of sin in an eternal hell. Not his own sin, as we know, because he had none. He's described in Hebrews as holy and harmless and undefiled. And separate from sinners, before his birth, the angel announces, that holy one which will be born of you, he says to Mary, will be called the son of God. Not his own sin, but the sin of his people laid on him. So in Isaiah 53, we read this. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's the curse of God against the sin of men and women that the Lord Jesus Christ experienced on the cross. The eternal punishment of sin contracted into that period of three hours. There's something in that, as I've mentioned before, that's beyond our ability to understand. But such is the wonder and such is the depth of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for his people. That's what the cross means, you see. That's what the cross means. It means curse. But it also means this. It means a curse born willingly. Now, as the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ takes away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist tells us. But that wasn't forced upon him. It was something that he willingly undertook. And it wasn't unjust. It was infinitely just. And it wasn't unnecessary. But it was absolutely essential if the justice of God was to be satisfied. In Genesis 2, before sin came into the world, the Lord threatened of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Later on, the prophet Ezekiel said, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. See, it's perfectly just. The soul that sins shall die. God makes no mistakes. And also we know that it's entirely unavoidable. So in Matthew chapter 5, the Lord says, Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of that prison till you've paid the last penny. Now that teaching, it's big and strong and powerful. And many people find it offensive. There's always been this reaction on the part of men and women to somehow avoid the full impact and force of the cross, rightly understood. The curse of God against sinners. And that doctrine has been attacked down through the generations in a variety of different ways and with a variety of different words, but it all comes back to the same thing. It's attacking what's known these days as the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. Right? Hold that in your head. Penal substitutionary atonement. People say things like, to think that God would punish sinners in hell, it would be a gross injustice beneath the dignity of God. That's what people used to say at one time. Okay? Then later on they would say, you evangelicals are always talking about blood, blood, the doctrine of blood, it's disgusting. We've moved on from there. We are more sophisticated people. And then more recently still, people have been said this idea that the father would punish his son in the place of sinners, it's no better than cosmic child abuse. Okay? But the point is the same, you see. It's attacking the reality of what the cross means, which is the curse of God against sinners. Willingly born by Jesus Christ, the Savior. So what is the cross? It's penal. What that means is it's a penalty for the broken law. It's substitutionary. What that means is it's the death of a sinless substitute in the place of guilty sinners. Substitutionary. And it's an atonement. What that means is that it's effective to bear the just punishment in full of sin and so turn away the wrath of God. That's what an atonement does, is it covers over sin and turns away the wrath of God. So if God has found a way justly to turn away his wrath by means of a substitute, it means that Jesus Christ became a curse for us as it is written. Cursed is he that hangs on a tree. And that's the only way for sins to be forgiven and to have peace with God. Now in our passage, when Peter hears that, he doesn't like it. Verses 32 and 33. 
there are objections to the cross of Christ. Jesus spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, there's a parallel. He says a little bit more. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. What's going on? When Peter hears, he will suffer and be rejected and be murdered. He says, not you, Lord. Not you, Lord. There would be something fundamentally wrong if that were to happen to you. Now, what's going on inside Peter? Well, there could be a whole variety of things, couldn't there? But these are the obvious ones. Lord, you've done nothing wrong. You don't deserve this. If that was to happen to you, it would just be unjust. See the point? And there's a sense, of course, in which he's right. But that's because he's failing to recognize that it's not what the Lord Jesus Christ deserves, but it's what he's taking on for us. Down through the centuries, there have been other objections. Um, people's views of justice change, you know? It would be unfair of God to punish one person in the place of another. That kind of idea. Or the whole idea that God would punish at all is beneath God and should be done away with. After all, you don't even smack a child anymore. You know? That kind of thing has happened. But there's also sometimes a deeper and a more deadly reason as to why people kick against this particular teaching. And that's self-righteousness. You see, to accept that Jesus bears the hell that the sins of men and women deserve is to accept that sins deserve hell. And that's a bitter pill to swallow because it means I really am that bad. So you can see that the reality of the cross as the curse of God is constantly in the firing line for men and women who object to the need of a saviour. The Lord Jesus in verse 33 puts his finger on it. He turns round and he looks at his disciples and he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. It's the devil, he says. It's a ploy of the devil to misrepresent God, misrepresent what God is doing, just like he did in the garden. He said to Eve in the garden, you will not surely die. And now he says to Peter, there is no, uh, now he says through Peter to Jesus, there is no reason for you to die. You see what's going on? It's the plot of Satan, isn't it? No, no, sin doesn't deserve death. Sin doesn't deserve death. God won't really do that. That's the way to think about the life. That's the way to think about the world. Well, if sin doesn't deserve death in you, then there's no reason for Jesus to die. And by doing that, what the devil is doing is he's cutting the throat of any possibility of salvation for men and women. Because sin does deserve death. The fall and the history of the world proves it. And the only way to be delivered from that death is to have a substitute who goes and stands in our place. The Lord Jesus says, you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. You're thinking about this, Peter, from a human, worldly point of view. What's going to be best and most pleasant for me? Oh, no, Lord, not you. Never you. That would be far too unpleasant to be considered. It wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be nice. It wouldn't be fair. But you're not thinking about it from the point of view of God. From the point of view of God, it is absolutely necessary because that's the way that God's saving purpose works in the world. So he says, get behind me, Satan. Don't tempt me with that kind of thinking that the cross is something to be avoided. See, the cross properly understood, it shows us the truth about justice. The reality about the justice of God is that God does punish sin and the holiness of God can't be compromised. And there's a very positive aspect to that because it means that ultimately righteousness and justice will triumph. 
Isn't that the kind of universe we would all like to live in? One where righteousness and justice are seen and are held on to and are loved and are worked out and are lived. That's what we want. Well, how does that happen? God needs to judge the present evil world and bring in a new heaven and an earth where righteousness dwells. It tells us the truth about ourselves. We're ultimately no better than anyone else. So the cross tells us there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's what it tells us. But it tells us something else. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sins. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. It tells us the truth about God and God's great concern for mankind. That he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, there's an offence in the cross. An offence. An offence to a fallen human sense of justice. That's not right, that's not necessary. That's because we don't understand the holiness of God and we don't understand sin. But as well as that, it's an offence to self-righteousness. I don't deserve that. So don't talk to me about the necessity of someone to stand in the place of sinners and bear the judgment of God. But without the cross, God's whole plan of salvation comes to nothing. So that's verses 31 to 33. The cross of Christ. It mustn't be misunderstood. It's absolutely essential and central. And when we dumb it down into something pleasant, we miss the point. It is infinitely and eternally unpleasant. Horrific. Barbaric. But when, as believers, we recognise that the Lord Jesus Christ has become a curse for us, and the cross is the means of his victory over sin and hell, then with the Apostle Paul we can say, God forbid that I should glory in anything except for the cross. Here's the second thing. The cross of the Christian, which is verses 34 to 38. Now Christ had a cross, as we know. But the Christian has got a cross to carry as well. You see what he says? Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And all those connotations of the horrific nature of the cross, they're all here in the minds of these first century Christians. All the people who are hearing this, they get it because they've seen it. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. He doesn't mean, of course, that Christians pay the price for their own sins. He doesn't mean that. It's Christ alone who's the sacrifice acceptable to God for our sins. It's Christ alone that atones. He doesn't mean that. But what he does mean is this, that in the path of following Christ, inevitably there will be hardships and troubles and suffering that need to be born for the sake of Christ. That's what he means. Because that's the truth at the heart of Christian discipleship. That's the inevitable nature of the Christian life. That when Christ redeems us and saves us out of this wicked world, it means we live in this wicked world as people who don't quite fit in. And how do we live here? We deny ourselves, we take up our cross, and we follow him. So three things. The cross means self-denial. Christ denied himself, certainly. And the Christian has to deny himself as well. How? Well, before we converted, we live for ourselves, by and large. You know, we live for our own priorities, whatever they might be, family, success, whatever it might be. And we live for our own pleasures. What we say is, we don't, I don't want to do that, don't like it. That's the predominant thinking, isn't it? Don't want to do that, don't like it. You'll only do it if you really think it's worthwhile. People live for themselves. But Christ, he saves us from our self-centeredness so that we can live a new life. And that new life means a change of priorities and a change of lifestyle. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter 4. 
Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. What's he saying? That's how you used to live. Enough is enough. Christ has saved you from that. So deny all of that stuff. And instead of that, live for the will of God. We've got to be denying any of those sinful desires and tendencies that would draw us to live in disobedience to Christ. Deny ourselves. So the question isn't, what do I want? Or what's the easiest thing to do? The question is, Lord, what would you have me to do? But self-denial means more than just denying the stuff which is sinful. It also means denying ourselves in those areas where things are perfectly innocent in themselves. But if we are taken up with that stuff, they prevent us from serving the Lord as we should. There's a thousand ways to waste time, including thinking of a thousand ways to waste time. Do you know what I mean? I, I was reading um, Thomas Brooks' or Putin book in the week, and Thomas Brooks has got this, this book on prey. And in it, he says, people will say to me, my life is too busy, I can't find time to pray. And he says, I will, he basically says, I will guarantee you that if you think about your life, you waste an hour every day doing rubbish. Well, stop doing that rubbish and pray. He's not quite that blunt, but that's basically what he says. And of course, he's right. There are loads of ways every day that we just waste time and fritter it away. What does the Lord say? Get your priorities right. Don't live for that stuff. Deny yourself. And, and do the first things first. Follow Christ. Put it into practice. Be real. Live as the people that God has saved you to be. What it means is we can't do that without denying ourselves. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I have to understand what you want, and I have to put that first. And if that's different from the way I was brought up, or that's different from what I planned for my life, or it's different from what I fancy, then I have to recognize that it's you that must increase, and it's me that must decrease. And that takes work, and it takes effort, and it's hard, but it's important, because Christ has saved me to live for him, not to live for myself. Self-denial. The second thing he says is the cross means submission. Because we deny ourselves and take up our cross. Christ bore the cross. That meant he had to submit himself to suffering. And Christians have to submit themselves to suffering. Any suffering which is necessary and comes across our path if we are to live a faithful life for Jesus Christ. Because there are a thousand ways where we can duck and dodge and avoid being faithful if it means the path is difficult. How about mockery? Some of us really don't like being made fun of. So like Peter, when the pressure comes, you were, this man was also with him, and that wasn't me. Avoid the sharp end, isn't it? Don't be caught out, don't suffer, don't be made fun of. It might mean problems in work or being passed over for promotion or not given enough hours or whatever it is. We can avoid that by fitting in a little more with the lads, you know? But that's not the way, is it? If suffering comes in the path of faithfulness, it's a cross which is to be borne, not avoided. Sometimes it's family friction. We've always got to be wise in the context of our own families. But sometimes it happens that there are family breakdowns and family problems purely for the fact that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Now, we've got to make sure that's the reason and not because we're just being awkward. But if that is the reason, it's a cross that has to be borne. And in some situations, in some parts of the world, it's very specific and direct and painful. It means persecution and mistreatment and death. But the point is, this cross has to be carried, not avoided. The Lord Jesus Christ carried his cross. He bore the shame. 
and Christians are called to do the same. Because that's the way that we experience and share in the fellowship of his sufferings. How about this in Matthew 5? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That's the cross, you see. Persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The cross means submission. Now, it doesn't mean having a kind of weird masochistic tendency and thinking the worse that people treat us, the more faithful we must be being. We've got to be honest and sensible about it. Nobody should want to suffer for suffering's sake. What we should want is to be faithful to Christ and not let the possibility of suffering stop us. We carry the cross. And the third thing, the cross means steady obedience. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Christ walked a path through this world, a path of righteousness and faithfulness, and we are told that we are to walk as he walked. And just think about what that meant. Christ put the Father first in his will, didn't he? You know, he's come down from heaven to do the Father's will. The words he speaks, the works he does, they are the things that the Father's given him. That's Christ's life. Lord, what would you have me to do? Christ lived a life resisting temptation to a degree and an extent that we have never known. Christ went around doing good. I'm always struck by those words, you know. You can go around doing good by visiting your next door neighbour. You can go around doing good by phoning somebody up just to check they're all right, as well as something on a far grander scale. But isn't that the way to fill your life and make it useful, to go around doing good? It's active, you see. We have to follow him, to get involved and to get stuck in. Christ lived his life by bearing witness. And that's something that we need to do as well, bearing witness with our words as well as bearing witness with our lives. But he leads us in paths of righteousness for his own name's sake, and we need to actively follow him. So on that little point, just notice, there's a difference between bearing our cross and following Jesus. Bearing our cross is being willing to bear with suffering, but following Jesus means conscious, active obedience. We mustn't fall into the trap of thinking, well, I would be prepared to suffer, and we become so focused and so inward-looking that we're not looking out to see what good we can do. Even in the midst of his suffering, our Saviour was doing good, speaking to John from the cross, man, behold your mother. What a wonderful example of balance and fullness in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it should be with us. So here's the last main thing. We've seen the cross of Christ and objections to it. And we've seen the cross of the Christian. But now we need to talk a little bit about objections to it. And that's verses 35 to 38. Because, let's be honest, people do object to this, don't they? There's a lot of stuff going around today. Um, you know, the Christian life is all about grace and what we receive. It's not about what we do. So we become very passive. Or the Christian life shouldn't involve suffering. Um, the Christian life should be a life of joy and fullness. The Christian life shouldn't involve sickness. If somehow I'm sick, then I'm outside of the will of God or I'm not able to serve him. That's nonsense. If the Lord puts us in a place where it's a path of sickness, it's because the Lord wants us to bear that cross and serve him in sickness. Even in sickness, we had to follow Christ. There are lots of examples in history of men and women who've been taken from positions of Christian leadership and put in a sickbed, and there they've been able to be faithful and to testify to Jesus Christ while they carried a cross. We've got to get the balance of these things right. Look at the objections here. Right? Verse 35. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. 
if you live a cross-shaped life, it's a waste. That's the objection Christ is responding to. If you live like that, it's a waste of your life. It's a waste of your life. You're much better to fill your life with these worldly things, the things you do, the things you own, the things you experience. If you don't get them, you lose out, and that means your life is empty. What a waste. Teenagers love them. They're bombarded by this. If you haven't got this, and you don't do that, and you don't look like this, then you're useless. It's an awful worldly standard. But you know, the same thing's true when you retire, isn't it? If you don't go here, and you're not able to do that, and you haven't got this much money in your pension pot, then you're useless as well. But it's not what Christ says. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Just be faithful. Actively faithful. Prepared to put me first wherever you are. And don't fall into the trap of thinking that if you don't have what the world can give you, then somehow your life is wasted. There's an even worse version of this. People think, if I do really give myself to serve Jesus Christ, whatever the cost, then it might mean that I'll have to leave home, I'll have to move away, I'll have to work in another part of the country, maybe I'll have to work in another country. It means that I won't be respected, I won't have the money, I won't have the job, maybe nobody love me and marry me, what would my parents say, what would my friends think, and all that kind of stuff. See, it's falling into the trap of what the Lord's talking about in verse 35. What will it profit a man if he saves the whole world? If he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You know? If you try and save your life in that way, you lose it. You lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake in the Gospels, then you save it. What does it mean to live a life that's not wasted? What does a full life look like anyway? It's not a life that's full of self. It's a life that's full of Christ. Any other life is just a tragedy. And if we live for self, what we find is that ultimately it's unsatisfying. And we look back and we think, why was I such a fool as to waste my life for all those things? Remember Jim Elliot? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's verse 35. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels, he will save it. There's another objection, verses 36 and 37. A cross-shaped life is an unsuccessful life. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you rather? Be a billionaire or work quietly for the Lord in a little church with a small income and a third-hand car? That's a challenge. Because what does it profit you if you gain the whole world but you lose your own soul? There's a question of priorities. It's a question of value. Are we seeing things according to the standards of men or the standards of God? What do we put first? That's the challenge of Christ. You can't put a price on peace of conscience. It's a fearful thing to face death knowing that you've traded Christ for earthly success and that you have no riches in heaven, no confidence that you can't face the prospect of death with any real confidence at all. What a tragedy that is. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then in verse 38, he gives us the real reason, which is the last thing for us tonight. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. You see, embarrassment. In the midst of a world that lives for anything but Christ, what Jesus describes as an adulterous and sinful generation, they live for anything but Christ. Christ and the gospel just doesn't mean enough to us for us to stand out and put him first and live for him. 
for some reason, it just doesn't cut the mustard. And when we're under pressure from our friends, we balk. When we're faced with temptation, we give in. When another hope or prospect comes into our lives, we change direction. We're ashamed of Christ and the gospel. But it shouldn't be like that. The Lord Jesus Christ was prepared to stand and to carry his cross. And his call to us in the light of everything that he's done for us is to deny ourselves and carry our cross and follow him. So use the call. It's to view life from God's perspective, not the world's. And that means put Christ and the gospel first before everything else. Live for him who died for you. That's the call. But how can we do that? How can we do that when we find the world attractive, we find our strength very weak? How can we do that? How can we put it into practice? When we attempt it to be ashamed and our pride is challenged and we feel pain. Well, what we need to do is we need to realise where the motivation comes from here. Why did Christ carry the cross? And why did Christ give himself to be a curse for us? You know why, don't you? Greater love has no man than this that he laid down his life for his friends. It's love that motivates Christ to carry the cross and bear the curse. And in our own lives, the same thing has to be true as well. It's love that motivates us so that we might put Christ first. We love because he first loved us. So what we need to do is to get a better handle on that love, to know it and contemplate it and pray it home to our hearts and think about it and sing about it and rejoice in it and pray to him and tell him. That's what we need to do. To have our hearts grounded in the love of Christ. And then when that's true, we show it in our lives by living for him. If you love me, deny yourself. If you love me, carry your cross. If you love me, follow me. That's what he's saying, isn't it? And that's the call to all of us. So may the Lord help us. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you. We recognize, Lord, that you're good. We recognize, Lord, that we need you. We pray from this passage that you'd help us to be ever more grounded in the reality of the cross of Christ, its essential character, our need of it, what he's done for us. And we pray, Father, that as that takes hold of us, so it is we might commit ourselves more and more to live for him that's died for us. Do hear us, Lord. And do help us, we pray, in the Saviour's name. Amen.